Welcome and thank you for tuning in to my talk titled Guilt by Association, Identifying Copper Alloy Equestrian Buckles in Archaeological Assemblages, uh, written for SHA 2022. I have two quick disclaimers before I launch into the paper. First is that while I cannot resist a pun and a title, I've never actually seen a gilt equestrian buckle. So if you see a buckle that has actual gold on it, chances are very good that's for a person. Second, uh, there's going to be a lot of slides that have a lot of artifacts on them, and if you are distracted by seeing 50 buckles on a slide, try to keep in mind that this presentation is all about assemblages, and we're not expecting you to inspect every last buckle in the 30 seconds that you might see a particular slide. So, all that being said, I will go ahead and launch into the presentation. On January 22, 1660, Samuel Pepys helpfully documented in his journal that this day I began to put buckles on my shoes. As a member of elite society in England, Pepys often noted new fashions in his diary, so this little detail offers archaeologists a decent beginning date for the rise in popularity of buckles for personal adornment in the second half of the 17th century, a trend which lasted until the turn of the 19th century. Buckles fastened or decorated a variety of garments and accessories. The most common of these were shoes and breeches, but buckles could also be found on belts or girdles, boot garters, hats, shirts, stomachers, bracelets, gaiters, spurs, and other accessories. It would be amazing if all of these buckles could be recognized and correctly assigned to their respective garments when recovered archaeologically, but if there is a decent source out there offering insight on how to tell an 18th century gator buckle from a garter buckle, I have yet to find it. Tempted as I am to go down that rabbit hole, and I really, really am tempted, Instead, I have been spending my time on the broader question of how to tell if a buckle adorned a person or a horse. Thanks to a grant from the Conservation Fund, I've been working on research into equestrian artifacts so that the MacLab can beef up existing equestrian categories of its diagnostic artifacts website, such as stirrups, spurs, leather ornaments, and bosses, and add new categories on colonial bridle bits, horseshoes, and saddle parts. I specifically did not include buckles in the grant because they present such an interpretive challenge. So I set out to study the artifacts I can definitely ID as equestrian. And while I'm at it, I've accumulated a lot of research on the buckles that should be present for horse tack. Among these are copper alloy buckles for bridles, which should be showing up on sites with other bridle parts, such as bits, bosses, and leather ornaments. While square framed iron buckles are widely assigned to horse tack, copper alloy buckles are not, and it seems to be because people either associate copper alloy buckles with clothing or their generic form makes it hard to narrow down function. My goal is to use whole assemblages to understand buckles that suffer from ambiguity thanks to their generic forms, because I think that there are differences of style that may emerge as diagnostic indicators of horse bridle buckles. My main case study for this paper is the Smith St. Leonard site, which has been the subject of public archaeology at the Mac Lab for nearly 20 years. So it's a huge collection with a relatively narrow date range, 1711 to 1754. Most of the main house has eroded into the Patuxent River, so excavations primarily concentrated on the kitchen, a laundry, a stable, and several quarters. Artifact processing is ongoing for the site, but so far I've counted at least 80 equestrian artifacts, not including buckles, 95 buckles total. This is not big data, but certainly enough to work with. Plenty of these buckles are not ambiguous thanks to previous scholarship and diagnostic attachments or chapes. Chape forms that include studs, an anchor shape or a loop and tongue are for personal adornment, with removability to allow one to change up these accessories on garments like shoes, breeches, and stocks. After examining a lot of buckles with diagnostic shapes, a few characteristics have emerged that point to use for personal adornment. The main ones are, one, two-piece buckles where the frame has holes for a separate swiveling pin that holds the attachments, 
Two, buckles that have finish work, such as tinning, filing, or polishing, so that the bumpy surfaces of cast buckles are smoothed on both front and back, the back part being key. And three, buckles that have a deliberate curvature to fit comfortably around a person's knee, instep, or neck. On the other end of the spectrum in terms of ID are the buckles I feel comfortable attributing to horse tack. The square or slightly trapezoidal iron frame buckles with a full length iron tine and sometimes a roller bar are the poster children for horse tack. These are generic enough to use on any strap, but in the colonial era before vehicles came into regular use, most were for saddle horses and they were used on girth straps, stirrup leathers, cruppers, surcingles, and assorted other strappy parts. On a related note, iron buckle frames that are usually slightly trapezoidal and hang from an iron strap with a rivet through them are civet buckles that attach to the saddle tree. So these are technically saddle parts as opposed to true buckles. When I apply these criteria to the 95 buckles in the Smith St. Leonard assemblage, 36 can be considered personal adornment, 20 are equestrian, and that leaves 39 ambiguous buckles for me to play with for purposes of this study. Most of them are symmetrical buckles that are cast in one piece, meaning that if there is the central axis, it's cast with the frame, not a separate pin. These buckles had a single tine, have no finish work to smooth out the casting texture on the back, and they typically lay flat. Also left over in my ambiguous category are asymmetric buckles with two openings, buckles with only one opening, which are often called D buckles, and strap keepers that generally get cataloged as buckles, even though technically they're more buckle adjacent. They're part of the story though, so I want to keep them in the loop Ha <laughs> ha. Now, if you've read the same literature I have, you might be thinking, wait a minute, I've seen that buckle identified before. But the IDs are a little all over the place, so let's explore IDs of one of the most common forms, this trapezoidal buckle you see here. First, in chronological order, Ivor Noel Hume's Guide to Artifacts of Colonial America listed this as a belt buckle, which seems reasonable in side-by-side -side with late 17th and 18th century images of belts and girdles. Fast forward to 2005, Carolyn White's publication on artifacts of personal adornment illustrates this buckle in the section on shoe buckles, and four years later she ID'd the buckle as a spur buckle in a journal article. Again, period artwork supports the plausibility of the ID. To see how these were being cataloged around 2015, I checked the artifact galleries on the Colonial Encounters of the Lower Potomac website and found images showing 13 examples of this exact buckle from seven different sites. Of these, eight were uncategorized, one was listed as shoe, one as knee, and three as unspecified clothing. Finally, I checked the images in DAX as another authority we looked to for material culture identification and found the buckle in the Utopia 2 catalog as a knee buckle. When this many highly reputable scholars differ on IDs, more research is needed. I have generally avoided specifics on the grounds that the buckles are so generic that they could be for pretty much any strap. But after immersing myself in the study of equestrian artifacts, I have come to believe that these and most of our other ambiguous buckles for the period from about 1670 to 1750 were probably used on saddle horses. Now I need to accumulate data either to back that up or disprove the ID. Unfortunately, sample sizes of both buckles and equestrian artifacts are generally too small for significant statistical or distribution studies. For Smith St. Leonard, for example, I attempted to make distribution maps in GIS to see if the ambiguous buckles correlate with the appearance of bridal parts. This failed utterly, thanks to a sample size of 39 buckles and 45 bridal parts distributed across 315 units. Without big data, I have to combine an abundance of historical and material culture research with a pretty broad approach to the concept of artifact associations. So first, the background research. 
Historical and archaeological data indicate that horse ownership emerged as relatively common in the Chesapeake in the last quarter of the 17th century. Use of horses for pulling vehicles and plows was rare until later in the 18th century, though. So from about 1670 to 1750, the horses were primarily saddle horses, and pretty much everybody had one. Horse racing developed as a favorite pastime in this era, and pretty much any time people traveled to see neighbors or go to court or church, they rode. This created a market for saddlery that was fulfilled by English manufacturers who exported finished bridles and saddles to the Chesapeake by the thousands, according to English customs records. These imports were listed by sellers as saddle and furniture, which refers to the saddle plus tack, such as girths, breast straps, cruppers, etc. Extra standalone bridles were also available with different bit types. Trade cards for English saddlers involved in the export trade illustrate what we're talking about. They show two types of bridles, snaffles, which have no decoration and few buckles, and curb bridles, which are adorned with ornaments and lots of buckles. Although this print is not in color, equestrian portraits suggest that the front-facing buckles for bridles and breast straps are typically copper alloy. Based on period images, Bridal buckles might have double or single openings, they could be symmetric or asymmetric, and there were at least two buckles for every snaffle bridle and up to 12 buckles for each curb bridle. These are characteristics and ratios we can compare to archaeological assemblages. Now on to the archaeological data. In order to test the ID of these buckles as equestrian, I am looking broadly at assemblages, first at the site level and second by searching for closer associations where possible. For example, if this kind of buckle regularly appears on sites with no other evidence of bridles, then the buckles may have been used for equestrian goods, but they probably were also used for other things, so they remain generic. If, however, the buckles only co-occur on sites with other bridle parts, then the likelihood that they were all-purpose buckles is reduced. I explored this question by again looking at the artifact galleries on the Colonial Encounters website and found that all of the sites with these cast one-piece buckles also had other equestrian artifacts in the gallery. This is encouraging for site level data, so the next step is to look within site assemblages for associations. Using Smith St. Leonard as my case study, I pulled all buckles and all artifacts that can be confidently identified as equestrian. Then I sorted them by site area. The artifact counts are limited and most of the collection is from plow zone, so the associations that emerge are relatively loose. But artifacts from the kitchen, stable, and quarters do show some interesting things. Not at all surprisingly, the stable is a hotspot for equestrian artifacts, but not for personal adornment buckles. There was a single pewter two-piece buckle, probably for a shoe, a shoulder strap buckle, probably for a weapon, and the rest of the buckles were either for tack or fall into the ambiguous copper alloy category I'm studying. This is not a ton of data, but does support the idea that these buckles are horse-related. The kitchen is a somewhat more interesting case because a large cellar was excavated there containing fill from a probable remodeling episode. All kinds of things made it into the cellar, including part of at least one saddle. The kitchen area also yielded portions of at least two snaffle bridles and two curb bridles, one of which was decorated with rose-shaped ornaments. Personal adornment buckles are better represented here with six examples, most of which are likely for shoes. Another six buckles fall into the iron horse tack category, but my ambiguous category outpaces all others with a grand total of seven. Admittedly, the association with horse hardware is no stronger than the association with many personal adornment items found in the cellar, but since the ambiguous buckles are stylistically consistent with the buckles from the stable, and at least four bridles were here, I th still think these are for horses. Finally, the quarters yielded 17 personal adornment buckles, 8 iron equestrian buckles, and 15 in our ambiguous group. 
There are no confirmed saddle parts in the quarters, as there are in the kitchen and stable, but there are bridle bits and bosses, suggesting that horse tack was stored, maintained, or used by the enslaved laborers living there. Additionally, if horse tack buckles were reused by the enslaved for personal adornment, this is where I would expect to find them. I interpret the overall distribution of the ambiguous buckles as supportive of the equestrian ID, but not completely definitive. I need to apply similar assemblage studies to more sites. Looking at the whole Smith St. Leonard buckle assemblage though, 95 buckles and counting, another characteristic emerges as common to the personal adornment buckles, and that is that each one is unique. There are stylistic similarities among them, but no exact matches. This makes sense for buckles that generally sold in pairs in a wide variety of patterns. By contrast, bridles could have up to 12 identical buckles, increasing the chance of finding multiples. At Smith St. Leonard, plain trapezoids, floral molded buckles, and frames with shell-shaped knobs recur. My working interpretation is therefore that these buckles were originally made for horses and not people. They are the only ones by process of elimination that could be the bridle buckles the historical images indicate should accompany all of those other bridle parts we're finding. That interpretation opens the door for other fun hypotheses to test, such as whether different buckle styles co-occur with certain ornament shapes. But more importantly, for all of the catalogers out there, it offers the tantalizing possibility that for this time period, we might be able to separate buckles from people for buckles from horses simply by looking at the finish work on the back. I'm not ready to commit quite yet. I don't have publishable data, but it makes sense. Personal adornment buckles are typically removable and would be seen front and back by the consumer. Horse tack buckles were sold in quantity to saddlers for assembly, not directly to consumers. Once in place on finished tack, the backs wouldn't show except when adjustments were needed, so there's much less incentive to polish up both sides. I am still just starting to build this data, but my hope is that archaeologists may be able to assign confident IDs to copper alloy equestrian buckles based on form alone. The MAC Lab currently has an NEH grant application pending to expand diagnostic artifacts, and if we get it, my assignment will be colonial buckles of all sorts. Separating people buckles from horse buckles is one big step that would help me complete that research and make some currently ambiguous small finds more valuable to site interpretations. Thank you for tuning in.